Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to be talking about a little project that I've been working on and I'm calling it the filament measuring system. So many of you might have seen that I've been working on this Stratasys 3D printer and I came across an issue. No matter which way I do it, the filament is going to be hidden inside the unit, so I'll have no way of determining how much filament is left when I go to start a print. In addition to that, I'm probably going to put this printer somewhere else in my house, maybe not in my workshop. I have an unfinished area in the basement that it might end up going down there. So it's all going to be operated kind of remotely, so I need a good way to determine exactly how much filament is left on the spool. So this is the solution that I came up with. Stratasys addressed this issue by using these filament cartridges. This is what a roll of filament looks like for the Stratasys machine. Inside of here, there is just a traditional roll of loose filament like this. The main difference is, is it's stored inside this cartridge and it has this little EEPROM chip in front. This little PCB on the back side has a chip that basically stores a couple different values. It stores what type of filament is contained within this whole cartridge and how much is left. Now there's no sensors or anything on here. That data is modified by the machine that it's put into. So if I put this into a machine, print something out and use 10% of the filament, it rewrites this cartridge and says you have 90% left. The problem with that is that's not really indicative of how much filament is actually left on here, it's just an indication of how much other machines have used from it. And I know they're pretty similar, but there are instances where the filament can come out of here and not get read by the machine. For instance, every time you switch filament cartridges in a machine like this, you're going to use about six feet worth just because of the way it snakes up through everything. And this cartridge will not really allow you to feed it back into it unless you completely open it up, break the seal, and then put it back together. So every time you change filament, you're actually going to be losing a percentage that isn't accounted for. In addition, let's say you have some kind of jam or some kind of issue with the extruder. You could lose quite a bit of filament through that, and it won't get recorded anywhere. Also, this relies very heavily on the machine tracking the serial number, tracking all that information, recording it in its memory. And then you have to have one of these with a chip for every type of filament that you're going to get. So it adds substantially to the amount of cost versus just having a raw spool. So I'm not going to be using a system like this because, once again, it's really just an indication of how much filament the machine thinks was used. It is not at all an indication of how much filament is actually left inside this cartridge. So what I'm going to do is more of a weight system to actually weigh the spool and determine exactly how much filament I have available to use. I accomplished this by building a filament spool holder that has a load cell integrated into it. This is a load cell. A load cell is a sensor that is used for measuring weight or load. So when you affix one side of it like that and then apply a weight or load to this other side, you can read that out into some sort of amplifier and then determine how much weight is being applied to that. So when we set the spool on there, we just simply read how much weight is on there, back out the weight of the spool itself, and that determines how much filament we have available for printing. So let's look at what it takes to read and calibrate one of these load cells. In front of me, I have a couple different types of load cells. Both of these are rated at 10 kilograms. I bought this one thinking the form factor would work better, but it ended up being just way too large. So I'm using this one for the um, filament measuring system. Then over here, I have a couple of um, boards that are necessary to read the output of these load cells. This is an open scale. This is um, from SparkFun Electronics. Actually, all this stuff is from SparkFun Electronics. The open scale combines a load cell amplifier with an Arduino, so it made prototyping with these load cells really easy because you just plug it into your computer, load up a um, serial terminal, and then you can do everything just in software. So this is a nice little shortcut to have. But for the final implementation of this project, I'm going to be using this load cell amplifier. Both of these are based on a chip called the um, HX711, which is um, a load cell amplifier. So the way these load cells work is they have a strain gauge inside so that when a force is applied like that, there's a little bit of a strain applied to this material and you're essentially measuring the resistance change in that strain gauge inside 
either one of these. And so the idea is, is that when you apply load to it, the resistance changes, you, re you read that output with one of these load cell amplifiers, read that into a microcontroller, calibrate it for a weight, and then you can ultimately translate that strain change into a weight in kilograms or pounds or whatever you're measuring. The first step to doing that, of course, is to get a known value weight. We need to calibrate this against a known value. So I went and purchased one of these nice little um, set of known value weights. And these are actually gonna be really handy when I build ant weights and stuff like that so I can test against it and calibrate my scale, whatever. But if you don't wanna buy one of these weight sets, they're relatively inexpensive, but you can go the other route, which is to just get a decent little scale. And these are relatively inexpensive off Amazon. Um, it's just a little scale. You can place something on it, weigh it, and then you just take that as a known value, apply that weight against the end of your load cell, and then calibrate it with either one of these boards as that known value. So that's kind of the first step that we need to do is calibrate this with a known value weight. For this initial calibration, I'm just clamping the load cell to my workbench so that I can put a weight on the other side of it. And then all I need to do is attach the wires to the other end of it. And there's four wires and they're color coded and they connect directly into the open scale. And then I just attach the USB and we're good to go. As soon as the board is powered up and connected, you'll see a little menu pop up in your terminal program and it will start giving you some readings. If you hit X, it will escape to this main menu. The very first thing we need to do is make sure that there's nothing on the end of the load cell, and we're gonna go ahead and hit one to tear it. So that will just set it as zero point. And you can see that um, negative 84,000, something like that, that's the zero. So now if we go back and um, hit X once again, we see that it's reading zero kilograms, which is perfect because there's nothing on the scale. However, the scale factor is incorrect. So if we exit out, and go into this calibrate scale, hit two, we can see it has a little menu. You hit A or Z to increment or decrement the calibration factor. And we notice that it's reading pretty close to zero, but if I take one of my um, weights, I'm gonna start with this um, 500 gram and place it on the end, you can see that it measures 516 grams, which is not correct. So we need to change this calibration factor. So I'm going to use the A key to increment this up, and you'll start seeing that value go down. So we need to get this down to where it's exactly 500. So I'm just going to keep doing this until it reaches exactly or close to 500 as I can. So there, I'm pretty close. It's about 500.1, 500.3, somewhere around there. So I'm going to take this weight off, and it should go back down to about zero. And I'm going to put on my 200 gram weight. And yeah, I'm measuring, you know, a little bit over 200 grams. So this is perfectly fine for what I'm doing with the filament. So I'm going to take this weight off. I'm going to exit back to this main screen. And when you exit out of it, it will save this value. So you can see the calibration scale is 211,958. That will be saved into the board when we exit out of it. So that's perfectly good. So now if I hit exit once again, I can pull out another weight. And let's see what this one is. That is 100 grams. So we are pretty perfectly calibrated right now. And that's really all it takes to set up and calibrate one of these load cells. Now that the load cell has been calibrated and everything's working with that, I need to make something that holds the filament spool on the end of the load cell so that when I pull filament through the machine, it spins around freely and doesn't bind up. So I did a little bit of uh, modeling in SolidWorks and I came up with this little thing. This is a little piece that sits on top of the end of the load cell like that and holds the spool. It has a couple um, interesting little features. I made this for all of the spools I have that look like this. All of my spools actually look exactly like this. So I started with a model of this spool and made something that would fit it nicely. So this fits this spool really great. And the cool thing about this is it's relatively cheap to make one of these. I think it's like $3 in hardware and then a couple of skate bearings. 
This can be made very cheaply so that you can make one of these for every type of filament spool that you have. So I'm just going to make a couple or a few of these just for all of these types of spools. But if I get a different spool, I can just kind of change this up a little bit. And it has these two little guards on the side. And so that is what keeps the spool from sliding off. You can see that it can't slide backwards, it can't slide forward, but there's a little bit of play for it to move. And um, these were laser cut, but you could very easily 3D print these if you wanted. I just kind of like the look of the laser cut. And then we have some skate bearings inside, some washers to space everything out so that the bearings spin freely. And the cool thing is, is a 5 16th inch bolt will fit through the inner diameter of a skate bearing really nicely. So I just used a couple bolts from the hardware store. No need to do any custom shafts for that. And then this is just a little 3D printed block that I printed on my Taz. And then you get two mounting holes that correspond to the load cell like that. And it sits just high enough for the um, bearings to spin freely. And so now the next thing I need to do is figure out a way to attach this end securely to the machine. And I'm going to have to do something a little different than 3D printed because that needs to be a little bit more solid. So I'm going to turn to the mill. It's been a while since I've used the mill and of course I made a really silly mistake. The stock isn't supposed to be laying flat. It's supposed to be laying vertically, you know, according to the cam that I wrote. So unfortunately, when I put the piece of um, stock in there and ran the very first program, it buried the end mill right in the middle of the stock and stalled and you can see the machine shaking and everything. Nothing was very happy, so I had to, um, you know, kind of extract that end mill from that. But then I started over with a nice clean piece of stock and everything went pretty fine from there. I tried a different setup for this piece. Usually what I would do is I would mill out the contour on a much larger piece of stock, flip it over and then, you know, shave off the bottom side. Or I would use a jig, drill the holes, clamp it to the jig and then do the outer contour, things like that. However, for this time, I'm trying to rely a lot more on the passive probe. So what I did is I did the contour on the top half, flipped it over upside down, re-indicated it, and then did the contour on the bottom side. This worked okay, but there was a little bit of an offset between the top and the bottom halves. And the reason is I didn't really pay attention to what corner I was indicating in. So when I flipped it upside down, I was indicating in the same corner, but that corner actually moved now because I flipped it upside down. So if you're going to be doing a technique like this, you need to keep track of what corner you're indicating off of. Maybe use like the jaws on the vise or something like that just to be consistent. So unfortunately, there was a little bit of a lip around it, but I took care of that later. After the contour was done, it was just a matter of milling out the channel. I did most of the channel when I was doing the outer contour, but I just flipped it over on its side, ran the end mill down the middle just to clean up the mill of the channel and clean up, you know, the kind of rounded corners off of that. And then I just um, drilled everything manual. I didn't do any of this step with a program because I really didn't need to. It was pretty simple and it would have been more complicated because I essentially indicated off the middle of that channel because the load cell is slightly off-centered based on the wires coming out of the side. After all the machining was done, it was just a matter of cleaning up that little edge or the little lip that was left over from the top and bottom halves. So I just used the um, combo sander just to kind of clean up that edge and, you know, make it a little bit prettier. Of course, I didn't have to do any of this. I mean, it was perfectly fine, but I figured why not? I'm trying out a new finishing technique for this piece for no real good reason. So I wanted to get it um, all nice and smooth and get all the machining marks out of there. After it was all sanded and smoothed, I threw it into the vibratory tumbler. In here, I've got the um, little pyramid triangular resin pieces. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tumble it in there for a little while, get a nice smooth finish on it. And then I'm going to try this um, rouge impregnated walnut shells, which should give it a pretty nice shine. So we'll see how that turns out. Instead of a nice piece of polished aluminum, I ended up with a piece of aluminum caked in rouge. So I need to change the ratio, so more on that in upcoming videos. Once I got all the rouge cleaned off of the aluminum block, it was time for final assembly. So this gives you an idea of kind of how everything assembles. I start out with the two bolts that run the length of the um, spool carriage thing. I first put on the guard, then a stack of washers, bearings, washers, 
then the block, then another stack of washers, bearings, washers, and then the final block, and then some lock nuts. The washers are there just to stop the um, bearing from binding up when you tighten everything down. They're just kind of like a, um, you know, like a bearing spacer. And I just use standard washers. I could have used an actual shim or bearing spacer, but washers work just fine. So once that whole block is assembled, it gets bolted onto the top of the load cell. And I used a couple more washers just to space it off from the load cell so that I know when I bolt the whole thing together, I'm applying an even force against the top of the load cell. The aluminum mounting block mounts to the other side of the load cell, and I'm using it to attach to this temporary wood jig that I made that you saw earlier in the video. And as you can see, everything moves nice and freely. There's no binding whatsoever. And so, yeah, this will be a good test to see how this um, filament measuring system works. This concludes part one of the filament measuring system, or FMS, as I'm probably going to refer to it from here on out. The proof of concept is good. I have the uh, mechanism here. That operates well. The um, open scale reads the load cell. That's nice but I still have quite a bit of work left to do. Step one is to come up with some sort of interface or some sort of display that I can use to read both of the spools, spool one and spool two remotely. And I might need to come up with some sort of menu system so that I can say a new spool has been loaded and then to you know take a new reading, things like that. It might just be as simple as placing the spool on there and it just reads a new value but I might need to at least select for different spool types. So that's something that I'm still kind of figuring out at this point. But overall, right now, I could probably pop this into the back of the Stratasys printer and um, you know, start testing it and prototyping it. The other thing that I'm gonna need to look at is temperature compensation. These load cells, because of the way they worked, I explained earlier about the strain gauges and everything, they will read slightly different values based on different temperatures. Well, the Stratasys printer gets up to different temperatures and I need to either do some sort of insulation to stop these from changing temperature or I need to read it and then compensate it. So I need to figure out how much of an issue that is and then how to correct for it. So that will be in upcoming videos, but for right now, I like where this is at, I like where this is going, and um, I just need to do a little bit more work on the printer so I can start implementing this into it. Thanks for watching and see you next time.